Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's CPD webinar. Uh, my name is Rick Manfield. I'm the Chief Executive at the Security Institute. This webinar has been awarded two formal CPD points for those of you that are participating in the Continuous Professional Development Certification Scheme. Uh, you'll receive those certificates in the follow-up to today's session. So what is today's session? Well, it's a personal fascination for me and I've, you know, I've done some short courses into this in the past, but nowhere near the degree that our, our thought leader today has. Um, but fixated persons uh, and the complexity of the, of the topic and how terrifying stalking can be, whether it's a physical threat or not, is, is what we're going to be discussing today. How do you differentiate between those that make a threat and those that pose a real threat? What's the difference between impulsive violence and predatory or targeted violence? Well, today's guest speaker has considered this a great deal. Uh, he was in his past police career, the man that members in the Houses of Parliament sought to answer these sorts of questions. And we will hear more about that as we go through his presentation. But I'm delighted uh, to introduce you all to Philip Grinnell, um, a member of the Institute and our thought leader for today. Hi, Philip, how are you? Hi, Hi Rick, good to speak to you. Superb, thanks for your time today. Uh, we really appreciate the effort you've put into your presentation and uh, you know, and delivering this for our members. But it's always good before we get going to, to give people a bit of a flavour about you. Why don't you give us a bit of a potted history of, of yourself and your career? Yes, hi, good afternoon to all of you and thank you for joining. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this and uh, hope that it's going to be an interesting educational and most importantly, a practical uh, webinar. So um, I'm Phil Grindel. I'm the founder of Diffuse, but as Rick has alluded to, um, my background is with the Met Police uh, and I retired from there as a detective inspector. Um, I came into this sort of world really because of the murder of Joe Cox. So at the time I was a detective inspector in special operations and when Joe Cox was killed, um, the uh, head of counterterrorism then, which was a guy called Neil Basu, uh, who I'd known for 25 years, he called me in and said, I need you to go and set up a threat assessment team and uh, in Parliament and start uh, uh, leading from there. And he sent me what were two, to him, probably quite simple tasks. And they were to stop the next Joe Cox attack and to uh, find out uh, what was going on in terms of the volume of abuse and what have you and uh, investigate it uh, and, uh, and report back. So that's what we did for the next three years. But in, in, in doing so, I was, um, I was actually doing a master's degree anyway. And I then decided that my dissertation would be on uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today predominantly. Uh, but of course, a lot of it had to be practically applicable. I had to really use what I was learning uh, and bring it back into the team and 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 use it. And so um, I was fortunate because of the place I was in that I was able to do a lot of research and meet some of the experts across the world who uh, who went before me. Um, but most importantly, I met a guy called Robert Fine, who was the writer and the the author of a lot of this stuff. And Robert was somebody who had been tasked by the US Secret Service to research all the attacks on uh, public figures in the US over a 50 year period with full access to the US Secret Service files and to come up with some answers about how they might um, prevent them. And he was the guy that kind of initiated a lot of this work and introduced a lot of these theories. Um, and I'm proud to say Robert's a good friend of mine and definitely a mentor and someone that I have picked his brain on over the last few years. So what I did was I took all that research and brought it back into Parliament. And within my research, I wrote my dissertation looking at all the attacks on UK uh, politicians this century and whether any of these theories would have been of any value. And the answer is they would have been. Um, and this came to the fore when we then had what was going to be the next Joe Cox attack. And we were able in our office to identify it as a genuine threat. And um, effectively, when I then phoned the, the uh, detective chief superintendent in charge of domestic extremism to say, I've got a job for you. And he said, how do you know it's a real one, Phil? I was able to quantify that with some of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I then retired from the police, as I say, and um, 
launched to Fuse, which is a specialist uh, security service. And we, uh, we work with high profile people and organizations who are being targeted. Uh, and they get targeted uh, and intimidated, they get threatened, they get abused. Uh, and we also provide a support service to security providers who look after them. Um, we haven't been going that long, but we are very genuinely a global uh, a provider. We've got clients in obviously London, we've clients had clients in New York and, and Australia. Um, and our goal, our, fun, our fundamental goal, is not just to uh, keep our clients safe, but actually to make them feel safer. Because certainly one of the aspects I found in Parliament was many of the people that we were working with, despite the fact they were very safe, they didn't feel safe. Um, and I saw amongst some pretty impressive people um, breakdowns. And I saw the impact it had. And so Diffuse very much provide that psychological support and expertise to yeah. our clients. But we do this in a number of different ways. We, we assess, we analyze, we advise, and, and we take action. Uh, we do digital audits, we do psychological expertise to analyze communications, and as I say, support uh, those that uh, suffer from the stress and anxiety of, um, of being targeted. But um, unless there's anything else, I shall, uh, I shall get on with the, the presentation. <laughs> It's um, it, it is um, it's fascinating and uh, what a job you have. Um, for those that are listening at home, uh, this is an interactive webinar, as all of our webinars are. Many of you have been on uh, many of these webinars over the past four months, but for those that haven't, we have a text box, a, a, a question and answer box to the side of your uh, screen. Please type your questions into that box during the presentation. Uh, we will collate all of those questions and I will deliver them to Philip at the end of his presentation. Um, so please don't wait until the end to cram them all in. It'd be good to just keep a steady stream going. Also, we have a, a three polls during this, which you'll be able to click onto the screen with your cursor to select your answer. So we get some feedback about um, your experience with, with dealing with uh, high profile uh, clients that may be under threat and you know you can give a little bit back to us so please participate in the polls live on your screen without further ado uh flip i'm gonna mute myself and drop off my camera now and let you complete your presentation i'll come back at the end okay. Yours. okay so good afternoon everyone so um I, as I said, I'm Philip Grindel, and uh, the online bodyguard is a title that that I was given, if you like, by uh, the media. So the Daily Telegraph actually first came up with it, uh, and I've kind of stolen it and, and continue to use it. You'll see two images on the first slide. Uh, one is obviously of, of Joe Cox. For those of you who don't know Joe Cox, she was a young uh, female um, uh, Labour MP. She hadn't been a member of Parliament very long. Um, but she was um, the first British politician to be murdered uh, in the UK by a non-organised terrorist group. Um, and that was really the start of my interaction uh, in this world. And we'll talk a bit about some of that um, as we go through. And the second image is the image of um, the tragic circumstances where we were attacked in Parliament um, and uh, uh, and that was towards the other end of my time there. Uh, I was a senior detective running that for about the first five hours. Um, and again, we'll talk about that job because they're, they're, they're kind of connected in a way. So um, that's the first poll question, really. It'd be interesting to, to see what uh, sort of responses we have. So the question today then is, how do you separate those who make a threat from those that pose a threat? Um, and the reason that's so important is because if you watch much of the news and you uh, read the papers and what have you, uh, you will often feel that um, everyone's being attacked on social media and being threatened and what have you. And certainly when I was working in parliament, um, it was daily business that we'd be called up to see senior politicians, senior police officers um, and or uh, others to, to report back on these uh, apparent threats that were coming on social media. 
So if you don't know how to differentiate those who make a threat from those that pose a threat, fundamentally, you're going to be using all your resources in the wrong area. Um, so that is the key question. And so what we're going to be talking about today is this particular subject is around targeted violence. Um, and this is the key because um, there are two sets of violence, two different bits of violence. There's what's called effective impulsive violence and predatory targeted attacks or targeted violence. And we specialize at Diffuse in predatory targeted violence. So effective or impulsive violence is your domestic violence scenario, your pub fight, your um, people who, who react to being cornered or, or they're threatened in the street, or even if, you, if you're sort of defending yourself from something, that would be effective or in, impulsive violence. And generally speaking, it's a kind of emotional response. Um, what we're looking at is predatory targeted violence. And that isn't uh, emotional in, in, in general terms. What we're talking about here is very much cold hearted, planned, uh, that they, they, they've got a, a goal in mind, that they, they, they're doing it for a specific reason. And very often um, they will be targeting specific individuals or organisations. When they do it, they say they've got a goal in mind, that they're, they're looking to achieve something. And it's not just a kind of um, impulsive act. They go through a whole process which takes them there. And it's that process which um, at times leaves clues and, and allows us to identify who they are. So we're looking at these sort of theories and as we work through them, and, and, and these theories become methodologies in how Diffuse have now uh, interpreted them. So we're looking at uh, grievance driven. We're looking at the theory of uh, hunter and howlers the intimacy effect, the pre-attack warning behaviours, the pathway to violence, which actually is one of the warning behaviours, but it's kind of standalone to some degree, and then communicated red flags. So we're going to take through that individually and work through it. So generally speaking, um, when we're looking at targeted attacks, they're initiated by some form of grievance. So it's something that's happened which has caused the individual uh, to have a real deep feeling about what they're doing. And it's very often work related or personal related, um, but equally it's often delusional or, or paranoid states of mind. So the, the key bit there is to you and I, it may seem bonkers what they're thinking about. It may seem completely irrational, totally illogical and not even true, but to them, it's really genuine. Um, and uh, quite often this grievance becomes such an obsession with them that um, they can't think of anything else and actually their mental health deteriorates. They see themselves look as a quest for justice. So the sorts of things uh, that, that cause it on, on the sort of right hand side of the slide is that sense of injustice. It's they feel like they've been treated poorly, they've been sacked for instance or or made redundant and they feel they feel aggrieved. Um, there's a belief that the benefits owed to them have been denied. They're owed exaggerated debts. They've got a desire for resent, revenge or recognition and, and a kind of aggravated sense of loss. And I, my personal view is we're going to see a great deal of this coming in, in the next uh, year, I would think. We, and I've uh, certainly already started to see this with clients in the last few days, a few weeks, really. So, you know, we, we know from previous cases that people have been made redundant in the last recession. They suffered uh, because they, they lost their homes, they lost their jobs. Uh, you know, many of them, their identity was linked to their jobs and certainly their, their lifestyle was. And they were looking for someone to blame. And, and sometimes it was the, the, the company owners who, who went on to get big bonuses and big benefits. Sometimes it was utility companies, for instance, who, um, who, you know, who would obviously want to be their bills to be paid and, and would incur debts on these people. Uh, it's not always an immediate thing. This grievance can 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 fester uh, and come out. Um, I've dealt with a client the last week that was, which I'll talk about a bit later, who's been targeted a, a, a global chief executive. He was sacked two years ago, um, but he's now um, um, he's now looking at uh, you know uh, 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 this deep seated grievance. It's kind of I suppose like a cancer in him. It's been building for some time now. So um, we then move on to this, is this hunters and howlers, and it, and it talks about two different talks, uh, sorts of people. And it's a really key element to, um, 
this this question about how do you decide who is making a threat to who is posing a threat? Because the theory being that um, hunters are the ones that actually intend to commit violence, whereas the howlers, they're the ones that to, want to frighten you or emotionally connect with you. So there is a, a anomaly to this, and I'll come to that. But what the research tells us, and this, this piece of research that was done for US Secret Service files looked at um, you know, five years, sorry, 50 years of, of attacks. And the, there's a really interesting fact that comes out of that. And that is that not one of the individuals who was attacked or killed was ever threatened directly by the person that carried out the attack. Now that piece of research has been replicated across Europe and my own sort of research that I did against British politicians, that also stands up. So the argument is that in actual fact, if you are receiving um, threats or, or, or abuse and, and, and being targeted online, they are generally howlers. They are there trying to frighten you, to harm you, to intimidate you. They are not the person that's going to probably attack you. What they may do is they may inspire others to, to attack. But generally speaking, uh, as, the, as the kind of the line underneath talks about, you know, howlers howl, but they don't normally hunt. Now, the exception to that rule, and it's a really important exception, is if and when there's an intimate or personal relationship between these people. Um, and then a hunter can turn into a howler, can turn into a hunter. Um, so when I was working in Parliament, as an example, we were getting you know, huge pressure around um, uh, social media abuse and the threats that politicians were getting. And it was a real challenge to try and persuade them that actually these people didn't pose them a threat because what they were reading was threatening and it caused them harm, emotional harm, psychological harm, reputational harm. Um, but, you know, and also senior officers in the police would get very nervous about that. Um, now, of course, the caveat to all of this, not only about the, the, the uh, intimacy element, but also this other thing is that, and we've never seen this just so we're clear, but of course, all of us now know this theory and, and, and certainly I know this theory. So if I was gonna attack somebody, I might put a threat in to, to deter um, people to thinking that I'm, I'm uh, actually posing a real threat. So whilst this is a general rule, and it's a really a good rule and a rule that I've stuck by, that doesn't mean we exclude a howler. Because as I say, howlers can, can, can inspire others. So it might well be that the person that's liking or, or is, a, is following the howler is actually the hunter. So we still look at howlers but we genuinely feel that they're not posing a threat in terms of a physical threat. They will pose a psychological threat, they will pose an emotional threat, and they absolutely will pose a reputational threat. But in terms of what we're looking at for targeted violence, we're looking at the hunters. So let's talk a little bit about the intimacy effect because it's a really, really important element and one that you have to understand, and it's where difficult conversations take place because the closer the, the intimate relationship is, the greater the risk. So that's why we see uh, intimate stalkers as a far greater threat than non-intimate stalkers, so, so stranger stalkers. And that's why domestic violence murders used to be so prevalent because of that, that emotional intensity that's involved in, 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 um, in the attack. But of course, there is an anomaly in this as well, because the intimacy doesn't have to be real. The intimacy can be a perceived intimacy by the person of concern. So to give you an example around that, um, very recently I had another client who was again a business leader and quite a, quite a high profile person. And it became apparent that this particular female who'd been following him on Twitter and um, interacting with him and on Twitter assumed that when he replied, he was actually replying to her personally. And so she, she kind of generated in her mind this illusion, this delusion, that there was an intimate relationship or potential intimate relationship between them. But of course, what happened was when she turned up at the Virgin headquarters, so you can probably tell who it was now, um, it all of a sudden uh, didn't, wasn't real. So suddenly, this, this, this perceived relationship was proved to be not real. So she took real offence to this and actually started getting quite hostile and started getting intimidating and threatening. Um, so th there's two elements there. One is the fact that she this perceived intimate relationship and the other is that she approached. And again, we'll talk about that. So I've had to have conversations with people in Parliament where they 
are getting these threats and some of the language of the threats or the intimidation um, suggests some sort of intimate relationship. And you know, I've had to have conversations. So have you ever had any sort of relationship, anything whatsoever that may, may have given this person any idea that there's a friendship or anything between you? Uh, and of course, often the answer is no. Um, but on at least one occasion, uh, I've had the scenario where we were about to go and arrest somebody and the person, uh, the, 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 the recipient of all the abuse phoned me at the very early hours of the morning and said, uh, actually, I've just remembered I had an affair with that person. Um, but that's important because suddenly then we know the risk has gone up. So I, I talked a while ago to, 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 to a, uh, a, a business leaders and I've talked about this with them. And, you know, I said that your security people need to better have that conversation with you. It's a really, really difficult conversation, but it's confidential. But unless you're honest about it, they can't manage the threat to you. So this is a difficult one, but it needs to be dealt with because it's so high risk. So that's our next poll. So we're then going to move on to the pre-attack warning behaviours. Um, let's move that out of the way from my screen. The poll is so. Uh, um, the poll is, uh, poll is live now. Okay, just so case you want it. Okay. Okay. So we're going to talk now about the pre-attack warning behaviours or indicators. Now, um, the, the the important thing to recognise here is this is not about predicting who is going to commit a violent offence. This is a series of indicators that are useful to help you identify accelerated risk or, or elevate concerns that you may have. So um, if you imagine it as a sort of funnel system, when you're looking at um, all the abuse or threats or whatever else that's coming into to, to the people that you're looking after, you, have, you want a way of filtering out those that, that don't pose a threat from those that do. And as we've talked about, one of those is, genuinely speaking, um, people that make threats don't pose them. But for instance, you might identify someone who's really fixated. Um, and so that's kind of a tick the box. So you think, OK, we're going to give that person a bit more attention. So it en enables you to sort of zone in on certain people. And certainly, and I'll talk about a couple of experiences, um, it's, it's absolutely beneficial in terms of identifying someone who genuinely is on what we call this pathway to violence and is going into attack mode. Now, I've never seen anybody who's had all eight of these. Uh, Anders Brevik is probably the closest, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about him at some point, um, but you don't need all of them. You can just have one. Um, certainly, I've seen one or two or three. Um, I think I've seen four before. Um, but even if you have just one, it's allowing you to, 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 to identify an individual who needs greater uh, investigation from you uh, and someone you can look at a bit more closely. So... This is the key model, if you like, in terms of threat assessment. It's used by US Secret Service. It's used by the LAPD's threat assessment team. Uh, and it's a really important model. Now, interestingly, everything on the sort of left of, of the boxes is, is my addition, and I'll, I'll talk about those. So this is what they call the pathway of intended violence. And it was created by Calhoun and Weston, who were the people that came up with the concept of hunters and howlers. And what it talks about is this, this the, the individuals that... Um, that go on this pathway and as we talked earlier around it's not an act it's a process and we see them going through this process now you'll see on the right there's escalation and de-escalation and that's because you know we're talking about human beings here and behaviors so they're not robots so not everyone does the same thing some people will just go from a to z in a, in a day almost some people will take years to go through that some people go up and down um, but they pretty much all will go through these various steps and and as I go through the presentation today, I'll, I'll highlight a couple of cases and we'll talk about you know, which step some of their behavior identified. Now, to the left of the boxes, you'll see uh, threat, vulnerability and risk and then, and then other bits. And that's because for me as a security professional, I think it's imperative that we understand what those terms mean. And by understanding what they mean, we know where we can intervene or where we need to, to take action to try and reduce them. And so I've linked them to this model. So when we're looking at um, threat, the threat that someone poses, threat is a combination of capability and intent. 
So we've already talked about um, uh, the idea of uh, the grievance, and we know about that. But then we move on to the violent ideation. So that's when they form the intent, if you like. So the reason they get to that point is because they effectively have um, got to a point where they think, they believe that they've got no other option. They've, they've gone through everything they think they can do. They're not getting where they want to get to. They're not getting the results they want. And now they consider that violence is a viable option and possibly the only viable option that um, they can they can uh, they can take. So, if we can understand that, and if we can identify that, then actually if we can resolve whatever their grievance is, however you choose to do that, then actually the intent is disappeared, and without any intent, you don't have any threat. So it's important to understand how these all link together. But of course, then we move into the the second bit, which is about capability, um, and that's researching and planning the attack. Um, and again, this will link it to some of the other elements we'll talk about later. But this sort of thing is where someone researches other attacks. Um, they'll, they'll do copycat type research. They'll, they'll research um, the person they're looking at. They'll research the building they're coming to. Um, they may well go at this stage uh, into, into sort of trying to acquire stuff, but that tends to be pre-attack. But certainly this is the capability. They're looking at do they have the capability to carry out the attack? So again, if we can dismiss the capability um, and, and therefore give less away on the internet, if you like, in terms of um, hostile recon that can be done there, we diminish their capability and therefore we diminish the threat. But of course, once they go beyond that phase, they go into the, the pre-attack preparation. And this is where really the kind of vulnerability bit comes in of your security plan. Because what they're looking for uh, are vulnerabilities. Uh, and at this phase, they are looking to acquire equipment. So they'll, they'll purchase things. They'll purchase knives or acquire firearms and potentially even take courses and get in the right skills. Um, they may do a, a rehearsal. They may drive the route of their, pre, of their planned attack. Um, they may be uh, preparing, for instance, their, their uh, manifesto, their post-attack manifesto. And again, we'll, we'll discuss that. Um, recording their farewell messages. Um, and, and as they do that, they're going to move into the probing and breaching, which is also around your vulnerability. And when they're looking there, what they're doing is they're testing your security. So they're testing your vulnerability. Um, and here again, um, that might be a cyber attack on you, because what they might be doing is trying to hack into your systems to see whether they can acquire any plans. Can they hack into the person's diary, see where he's going to be or she's going to be on a particular date and time? Can they hack in and see? what uh, home addresses you have. I mean, I, I'll give you an example here of, of a simple one that happened a few years ago um, when they when they first started looking at the third runway at Heathrow. And a person telephoned the chief executive of Heathrow Airport Limited and got through to his PA. And he said that he was another of the executives that the PA knew but didn't know personally and asked and said, he's got a meeting with the boss, um, but I don't have his phone number. You couldn't give it to me quickly. I'm in a real scrape. And of course, her her mentality wasn't from a security perspective, but from a kind of business continuity. So she gave out the chief executive's phone number. So the individual concerned suddenly had the chief executive's phone number. Um, so they identified a vulnerability already, and they started, you know, uh, probing that. Um, so that's the sort of thing, you know. Don't don't assume that all hostile recon that they're going to start doing on on you or the or the or the venue or the premises is going to be physical. It might be cyber. Um, it might be you're at various events and you see the same person popping up time and time again, just watching. Um, and, you know, talking to some security uh, providers recently when I've been doing some training with them, you know, in terms of their debriefs, um, it, it's, you know, I, I don't remember one case where anyone said to me, yeah, actually, we got, we got debriefed on this individual keeps turning up. But there's, there's loads and loads of cases of celebrity attacks where they look back then and they realize actually the same person was turning up, but because they were using different security teams or different venue teams, um, but uh, no one was joining that up. So that's a really important area to sort of, in terms of your debrief around movements of your principles, uh, are you seeing the same people? Is that person testing or probing or, or researching your vulnerabilities? And then of course, the next phase they go into is the attack phase. Um, and of course, risk, is around likelihood and impact. And so if, so if uh, you can remove the impact, if you like, and, and we're talking about reputational damage here, so 
you know, if, if for instance you you're looking after a client and they happen to be have a particular secret around their sexuality or their marriage or whatever else, if they go public with that, then of course the person that's trying to cause them reputational harm suddenly has no ammunition because they've gone public. Um, so there's no impact and therefore there's no risk. Um, so really, um, you know, this is the process that people go on. And if when we're doing our research, we can identify where they are on their process, then A, we can we can look back and say, well, are we threat vulnerability risk? And we can start looking at how we can intervene and what, what actions we have to take to put preventative measures in. Um, uh, but also we know about whether we need to start looking at our own security and vulnerability. So um, this lady here is a lady called Rishanara Chowdhury. She's currently serving a life sentence, um, although I'm uh, uh, aware that she's taking steps now to uh, seek her release. So she attacked Stephen Teams MP um, some years ago. So her story is that she was the daughter of a first generation Bangladeshi family. Um, she was the success story of that family in that she was um, very, very, successful student at uh, London University, where she was coming towards the end of her studies and predicted to get a first in her in her degree. Um, she was a, a normal London girl, nothing particularly uh, special about her, but all of a sudden, um, unbeknown to, to apparently everyone, um, she started to lock herself away in her bedroom on the um, excuse of studying, but actually she was watching extremist videos, Islamic extremist videos. Um, and there is some suggestion that she was interacting, but that's not proven. So by doing that, that's where she formed her grievance of the, um, the unfairness in treatment towards Muslims. One of the videos uh, she was watching talked about um, giving females the permission to fight. And this was a really important step for her because prior to that, there was a suggestion that she didn't quite know what to do about her grievance. But this, this particular video talked about how females can take part in this fight and, and she interpreted that to mean that it was a license for her to, to conduct an attack. <coughs> and that, it was at that point that she created and, and developed her violent ideation. She then went on to research all the MPs, members of parliament, British politicians that had voted for the war in Iraq. Now, it's worth saying, this was about seven or eight years after that vote. The interesting thing was, and the interesting thing about all of our attacks in the UK, is that she decided on her local member of parliament. Now, every attack in the UK on a British politician has been on a local MP by a local constituent this century. And there's a good reason for that, and it's vulnerability. But before we talk about that, what's interesting is that some of the other MPs in the next uh, constituents, the neighbouring constituencies, two of them were Jewish. So you might have thought, actually, that's where she's going to target her, her her aggression towards. But she didn't. She went for her local MP because of vulnerability. Because the rule in the UK is that if you contact your local MP, they have genuinely have a duty to respond to you and you can request to meet them in person and have an appointment. If you contact an MP who is not your local MP, you will get an email back saying, we can't engage with you, contact your local MP. And that is perceived to be why all the attacks are on local MPs by local students. We then saw that she very quickly dropped out of university, which was a huge shock and surprise, but interestingly, no one did anything about it or questioned her. She paid off her student loan and closed her bank account. And she did that because she knew she was gonna go and do an attack, she was prepared to die. And what she didn't want was the UK state getting access to her funds. She then bought the weapons, knives, got herself prepared, and she circumvented the security, the breach of security, by basically making an appointment. Uh, she then attacked Stephen Timms, um, uh, stabbing him. And just of an interesting side note, what she actually did was um, Stephen, who's an who's a absolutely fabulous guy, came around and reached out his right hand to shake her hand, and she put out her left hand. Now, um, there's a whole different subject matter about uh, unconscious thinking. Um, but um, she, he then thought, that's a bit strange, but anyway, went to, went to shake her with her left hand, with his left hand. And the reason being is that she had the knife in her right hand and she wanted to open up the target to attack him. And that's exactly what she did. But she, he grabbed hold of the knife and uh, 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 managed to disarm her. Uh, and then she sat down and waited for police. 
and fully admitted um, fully admitted the offence. But she went very clearly along that 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 uh, pathway to violence. So the next one is fixation. These are in no particular order, just just so we're clear. One is not more important than the other, but um, I, I tend to take them in this order because this is the order they often manifest. So when we're talking about fixation, we're talking about what's called an increased pathological preoccupation. So, you know, what that means is they are basically so fixated on something, they just can't think about anything else. Um, now, it's either on a person or on an ideology on a, or a cause. In my experience, and, and all the attacks in the UK, as an example, have always been on a cause or an ideology. The person who is attacked is not the person of their fixation. Um, he is he or she is a person who has something to do with the ideology or cause. Um, the fixation, it, it, you know, again becomes obsessive, and it, you know, is, as we know, is very linked to stalking behaviour. Um, it's very difficult to pick out without any indicators, but one of the indicators is you will see a huge amount of information or interaction or or um, um, communication. Again, we've mentioned about people turning up at events. You know, if you, if you are looking after someone who's high profile or a celebrity, they will have fans and some of those fans become fixated. They become obsessed with this individual. They they th feel that they know them. Um, and that becomes an issue because one of the issues around fixation is that need for close proximity. So that means they need to get close to you. So, um, you know, a very obvious point, though, is this. We had a client, again, very similar situation. She, you know, this person was a, um, a global icon and we had a threat from a fixated person. But we could establish the fixated person was 2,000 miles away. So therefore, they don't pose a threat. Um, so, you know, the issue around close proximity. Of course, what we had to do was monitor that person to see whether they were traveling. But um, if they have got that fixation and they do travel um, because of that close proximity, that's an elevated risk. So fixation is a, is a key element. And we're talking about the murder of Joe Cox, which, which, which kind of initiated my entrance to this. Uh, Thomas Mayer, who was the person responsible and was uh, sentenced to a life term in prison, uh, had a fixation. He was, a, he was fixated on white supremacy. He was racist uh, and had a long term fixation on it, going right back to the South African regime, regime per, uh, period. Um, he was even known to the um, an organization called the Southern Poverty Center, which if you don't know, they're an organization that operates in the southern states of America, um, tackling far right and white supremacists. And they, they're very um, well established and quite reputable and do huge research. And, and they identified, for instance, that Thomas Mayer had been sourcing white supremacist literature from the US. Um, and he saw the whole vote on Brexit and um, that as his last resort, if you like. So he already had his grievance against immigrants. And um, for some unknown reason, uh, and again, this is delusional, uh, it, it wasn't true, but he had this thought in his mind that his home, he'd be kicked out of it and it'd be given to, to immigrants. So um, what he did was become fixated on this and he targeted um, Joe Cox, the MP. Now, interestingly, what often happens, and we've talked about it with Chowdhury and he's the same, is that what they often do is they what call target dispersal. They target more than one person. He also targeted another member of parliament, a former prime minister called William Hague. So William and Joe Cox uh, were um, neighboring constituency MPs. They both were anti-Brexit. They both are pro-immigration. Uh, but of course, William Hague, as a former prime minister, um, had protection. Uh, he was also a man and he was also a former soldier um, and also he had no uh, obligation to interact with Thomas Mayer or, or, or see him. So Thomas Mayer fixated uh, uh, his attack on, on Joe Cox and he, um, you know, almost no one had ever heard of him. As you can see in the pictures, he had a, um, a British commando knife and he had a firearm, uh, which was never uh, identified the source of. But someone must have known what he was doing or what he was talking about because he suddenly acquired a firearm. He did conduct hostile reconnaissance. He went to the venue where Joe was attacked uh, two or three times in the days beforehand and did proper reconnaissance on it. Um, we know he did loads of research. If, if you 
um, if, you, if you were ever privy to his crime scene, it was a bit like one of those TV shows where you had a wall up and pictures on the wall of all the people and what have you. Um, and he even knew what registration number her car was. So he was ready for her when she came. So here's a man that had fixation uh, as well as one or two other of these indicators. So identification is another one of the indicators. And it's quite an important one that links, um, uh, links back into the pathway to violence as well. So um, what uh, they talk about, and, and, and th this, this methodology we're talking about is used a great deal by, by psychologists as well. So that, that certainly I work with, but, but in um, other environments as well. And they talk about this phenomenon called pseudo commando. So effectively, it's like a kind of warrior mentality. Um, and basically, it's people who want to consider themselves to be, you know, soldiers of a cause. And we often see them dressing up in military uniforms or, or other types of uniforms. And what they'll often do is associate themselves with uh, other attackers. And we've seen sort of copycat attacks uh, or one-upmanship. And sometimes the, 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 the communication or some of the red flags they raise is when they're talking about those sorts of things. Um, but um, uh, you know, so going back to the pathway to violence, this is the research and planning phase where you will see, the, see these sorts of things. And you know, one of the best examples of this is our friend Anders Brevik, who uh, created his own little world. Um, and as we can see, he's kind of um, bastardized what I think is supposed to be a US Marine uniform. Uh, the second one is his NBC kit, which he's got um, a cross on, and that's a, a Knights Templar cross because he, he suggested he was a Knights Templar. Um, there is such an organization and he wasn't part of it. Uh, the next one is, I think him thinking he's a Navy SEAL or something. And the last one is Masonic uh, outfit. Um, and he wasn't part of any of those organizations, um, but he absolutely um, uh, fits the bill for most of this, this pathway to violence. He absolutely had a grievance, again, immigration, what have you. Um, he you know, clearly had a real grievance. He clearly worked out that violence was the only option. He did extensive research and planning, um, so much so that he even test fired weapons, test fired explosives, uh, and, and really meticulously planned it, part dummy vehicles. So the first vehicle that had an explosive in, he had a getaway car. Uh, it was a real, dare I say, it, kind of military planned operation. But all this, um, all, all, this uh, all these images were all freely available on the internet. So, you know, that they could have been identified. So, you know, clearly, if you're looking at someone and that you find images of them dressed up in all various costumes and what have you, um, that's, a, that's a red flag for a number of reasons. And then we come into this next one, which is called leakage. And um, this is where they communicate the intention um, of what they're going to do. And it's not always going to be, I'm going to kill someone. That, that's, that's not how they'll do it. Um, although they might do, but um, and, and we'll talk about a couple of a couple of times when that has happened. But quite often, it's very much just more subtle than that. Um, and it will be done in person. They'll be talking to friends and colleagues uh, about about um, what their intentions are. They will be engaged in online forums. Um, they may keep a journal. They might write letters and, of course, manifestos. Uh, and Brevik, who we've just seen, I think he published a 300 page manifesto. And manifestos have become quite popular. A lot of the school shootings in the US, they publish a manifesto to, to, to give you their grievance. Uh, vivid examples of this are the murder, the 7-7 seven, seven bombers in, in, um, who, who attacked London. Because of course the videos were made sometime before um, the, uh, the actual attacks. And, and if you see any communication, uh, often it's past tense language. Now, there is some indication it's more prevalent amongst younger people than others. I'm not persuaded by that necessarily, um, but, uh, you know, it's quite common. So uh, an example of that actually is in terms of a younger person was a schoolboy up in Newcastle a few years ago who was um, excluded from school. And um, unbeknown to everybody, he had acquired a firearm um, via the Internet and it had been delivered by the Royal Mail, believe it or not. But what he was doing was going on Facebook and, and kind of making various comments and what have you. And just by fortune, one of his school teachers read it and thought, that's not right. Something about that is wrong and um, informed the police. And the police, when they knocked on his door to arrest him, uh, were surprised that he was pleased to see them because actually it was a bit of a cry for help. 
he didn't really want to go through with anything and that's why he was leaking information um so that's a good indicator uh, but you know others will be things like they might say something like um watch the news tomorrow or uh, if i was you i wouldn't go to school tomorrow or if i was you i i wouldn't go on the tube tomorrow so it won't necessarily be uh, i'm going to kill someone tomorrow or i'm going to do this tomorrow or what have you but it'll be more subtle than that there actually is a whole um a piece of research now around suicidal videos because often these go ahead these these go along with suicide in terms of their um their intention is to is to commit suicide or or, or be killed in, in the process um and there's, they're looking at suicidal images on the internet now and how they can actually interpret those as being this son of leakage um but this is quite a common one and, and certainly two or three of the cases that i've investigated which i'll talk about very briefly uh, there was very clear leakage the trouble with leakage is sometimes we don't know about it until afterwards because suddenly someone will say do you know what he did actually say something about this or this did actually i did see this or read this um so people don't always realize what it is but sometimes it, it is the ramblings you know in layman speak ramblings of a mad person but the important thing is not to exclude that not to just ignore it and think oh it's just nonsense it's just a, a bloke venting he may well be a person venting um, but you need to satisfy yourself that that's not him leaking information about what his intentions are. And a very good example is this. So this is Khalid Massoud, who was shot and killed by police um, when he attacked uh, Westminster a couple of years ago. And as I say, I was the, the kind of senior detective there for the first few hours. But when they, when they researched him, they found that uh, five days before the attack, in a goodbye visit to his mother, he turned to her, as he was saying, and said, uh, they'll say I'm a terrorist but I'm not. Well, I don't know about you, but if I left my home and said to my mum, they'll say I'm a terrorist, but I'm not. I think that might raise some eyebrows. She might be thinking, what are you on about? But of course, his mother didn't tell anybody. And that was him leaking. That was him leaking the information that something's gonna happen. And we also think he did other uh, forms of leakage. And we know that he sent WhatsApp messages and what have you moments before the attack. But it's, it's really, really common. Uh, to see this and we see it a great deal in the US when we're looking and researching um, some of the school attacks we see a huge amount of leakage where they will correspond to, to other kids that they like and say don't go to school or don't do this or so and so is going to find out how important it is um, it's leakage and it's to be taken seriously and until you've, until you've eliminated that person as a genuine target or a genuine threat if you see comments or view videos what have you or, or subtle things like that uh, think about leakage Another very common indicator is this way, which is the, 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 the what they call the, the language of no hope. Um, and we used to get this quite a lot when I was in Parliament. Um, so this is this kind of, this is the violent ideation. So it's the point where they decide they've got no other option. There's nothing else to live for. I've got no other choice. I mean, I'm cornered. I'm, I, I've done everything I possibly can. Um, and, and we often see it in terms of the suicide by cop. And uh, I'll talk about Renshaw in a moment. Um, because he, he again, uh, uh, gave away quite a few of these indicators. Um, quite often, there'd be reckless behaviour uh, because they've got no worries about the future. They're not bothered about what's going to happen because as far as they're concerned, they won't be there. Um, so, again, very popular one. So we used to get it in letters quite often um, in, in Parliament where they would say, you've left me no choice. I'm going to have to do something now. Um, and, of course, that's a red flag to us. And we would then um, uh, conduct an investigation and, and, and go for it. Um, so that happened with this individual. So Jack Renshaw um, planned to murder Rosie Cooper, who was a local MP. She was going to be the next Joe Cox. So Jack Renshaw is a five foot three nobody who was being investigated actually for downloading indecent images of children by police. But he was also a white nationalist and a racist. And he was member of a group called National Action. Rosie Cooper, who is a lovely lady, she's um, about six foot two and about 18 stone, 20 stone probably. She's an um, uh, absolutely dedicated member of parliament and she just happened to be his local member of parliament. And no one would have ever heard about Rosie other than this because she just went about her business quietly. But what he um, leaked to some of his friends in a closed meeting in a pub um, was that he intended to kill her. He was going to kidnap her, um, call in the local police detective that's investigating him, 
kill him, kill her, and then he was going to commit suicide by cop um, by running towards him wearing a, a fake suicide vest, and that's his that's his last resort language. So this intelligence was leaked, and it was leaked because he also talked about attacking a synagogue and murdering children. And one of the individuals in the meeting decided that was going a step too far. And so he reported it to an organization and a, another MP who was a previous chief executive of that organization came to us and said, I think something's gonna happen. Uh, we've got this information. And what made it different to other information that we used to receive was a number of things. Firstly, the leakage. Secondly, the last resort language. Um, uh, thirdly, the, 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 the intelligence we had around him. And um, so that's when I was able to phone um, the detective chief superintendent who um, uh, initiated the investigation. Um, he, um, he was arrested. Interestingly, he'd gone to ground, uh, but he was arrested. We know he purchased weapons and started planning various things. Um, he was convicted of um, the, uh, the uh, plot. Uh, he was also convicted of becoming part of national action. And he was also convicted of his um, paedophilia content uh, and given a life sentence. Um, so um, he, he was someone who was very much using last resort language. And that's a kind of extreme end in terms of uh, suicide by cop. But you will often see things like, you know, you've given me no other option. I've got no choice. I've tried everything, all that sort of thing. So those are kind of key phrases that you want to look out for. Uh, moving on, we come on to novel aggression, and this is where an act of violence or aggression or uh, is is acted kind of sort of off the off the chart. So, generally speaking, this is where somebody um, they haven't done anything like this before. So, you won't get this if they're a career criminal or, they, or they've been violent or they're a previously serving soldier or a police officer or something. This is where someone who's never done anything violent before suddenly has to see, can I do it? It's often unrelated. Um, sometimes it's things like graffiti and criminal damage, uh, arson, cruelty to animals, that sort of thing. But it can be totally out of character. When you're doing your research, you might see a completely random offence they've committed a couple of years ago. Don't exclude that because, as we say, sometimes these are long running things. Equally, we'd look at certain people and we'd have a random offence of, um, you know, animal cruelty or, or, or an assault. And we dismiss it. And so we realise, actually, maybe, maybe this is them testing themselves. And some of you will remember this chap who attacked the Canadian Parliament a few years ago. Well, again, he, he demonstrated this because the attack was in 2014. But in 2011, he walked into a police station and confessed to an armed robbery. That armed robbery never happened. Um, now, he might have been testing what they were going to do. But the next night, he then attempted a robber McDonald, bizarrely armed with a pencil. And again, he waited for the police. And the, 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 uh, the research into this particular case, again, talks about the fact that they think that was what he was doing. He was A, testing, but he was e, e also seeing, can I do this? Can I commit an offence? Uh, he attacked the parliament and sadly killed a soldier, but um, he was then killed by, by police uh, at, at the venue. Okay. So energy burst, and that's a real important one. This is where all of a sudden they go into an escalation period. Um, and it's characterized by an increase in activity. Suddenly they start doing things because they're coming to the point where they're going into attack mode. This is a really crucial one. And um, if you see this, certainly it's one that we take very seriously. Um, it's, um, it sometimes can be just a range of different activities. Sometimes it, it might be sort of frequent shopping trips. They're, they're buying all their stuff up. They're getting ready to attack. They're finalizing their plans. It might be suddenly getting rid of all their assets. It might be suddenly trying to you know, rent, moving their flat out, moving their stuff out. Um, but you'll see an ordinary, a, a sudden a list of activities that they go into that they um, do because they, they're getting ready to attack. Uh, and as I say, Chowdhury did this, the lady we spoke about earlier before she attacked Stephen Timms. She went into a whole mode where she drew a, a, a bank account. She booked an appointment to see the MP. She, <coughs> she purchased knives and she did it all very quickly. The worrying thing about this one is that quite often it is the precursor to the attack and we don't always see it because it all of a sudden happens. But if you have, if you are, if you have got a surveillance team, for instance, on someone you're watching as a person of concern and sudden you see a, an energy of action, um, be aware that might be something they're doing. And then this one, approach. 
and it's really, really important for a number of different reasons. The first reason is that we know when we talked about earlier on the fixation is that desire for close proximity. So all of a sudden you'll see someone wanting to be close to the target. Um, it might be because they're conducting hostile reconnaissance and they are uh, testing your security. It might be because they are um, looking to see where they can hide potentially, what their exit route is. Um, and also possibly testing themselves to see, can I do this? Um, but of course, if you've got somebody who is several miles away, hundreds of miles away, and all of a sudden they travel to where you are, that's an escalation and that's retreated seriously. Again, we saw this in Parliament where we had a couple of cases with politicians being threatened and abused and targeted. And all of a sudden, the person would pitch up outside Parliament when actually they live 200 miles away. So, again, it's, it's an important one if you do get this and you start seeing this. Uh, and it's why you should do debriefs after any deployments to see, you know, did we see the same person there again? Is there a reason why he keeps pitching up? Um, is this part of what they're doing? And I'm going to go back a number of years to this one because this is a really good case. So this is the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, uh, J.F. Kennedy's brother. Uh, and in 1968, this particular individual assassinated him. He shot him a number of times. But interesting, the five months leading up to that day, he, he made four approaches. Now, they don't know whether they were failed attempts or efforts to see how close he could get. Um, but actually, he got very close. And his attack was motivated by the first anniversary of the Six Day War and because Kennedy was voting to sell uh, phantom jet fighters to Israel. Um, and actually what he did was he identified a place uh, and I say he hid in the pantry where uh, Bobby Kennedy walked past and he, he got out and shot him. Um, and uh, it, I think he's still in prison as well. Um, but again, you know, there were lots of signs there that were ignored or not noticed or not realized. So if you're seeing this, be aware of it. That's the sort of thing you're looking for. So we're coming to our last poll question now. That's, do you feel confident you can identify and manage a case involving a stalker? So then we come on to um, this last bit, which is the, um, the, the, the red flags. And the reason they're so important is whilst um, behaviour is more important than language, sometimes this is an indication of behaviour. And for me, this is why it's so important. It's not just your security teams that are aware of some of this. It's, it's your, your PAs, your secretaries, your admin staff, because they're the ones that will see the communication. The only person that will probably see the, the communication of the, the chief executive, for instance, will be the closest, you know, his chief of staff, his PA, etc. So unless they know what they're looking for, they will probably see things and dismiss them. And actually, that may be the indicator you need. So that's why I'm a great believer that it's not just security that have responsibility for security. Um, so if we talk through them, you know, you might get letters or correspondence or emails or other things where there's talk of homicidal ideation. That's that's not necessarily I'm going to kill you. Sometimes it's declared thoughts or fantasies they're going to talk about. You know, it might be I just wish you were dead or something. Uh, or they might be, you know, have delusional beliefs and talk about various things. Um, but you, you will see that some of these interact with some of the other ones. And I've seen all of these in, in communications and they're all sometimes very subtle. You know, we've talked about end of tether language and how, um, you know, people say, oh, I've had enough. I, I can't go any further. You, I've, I've, you know, I've tried everything. So that's a very common one. Um, you know, often the end of tether and suicidal can be, com can be combined and sometimes might kind of suggest a sort of post incident that they, they've got no fear of what happens because, because they're going to be dead anyway. So, um, you know, if you do get that and sometimes it's a cry for help and it's a cry for attention. But unless you've investigated it, you, you really won't know. Delusions of jealousy are often connected with the intimacy issue around people thinking there's some sort of relationship and these delusions that they're, that they're in a relationship and they, they're owed something. So, again, don't dismiss that as just, you know, some sort of silly person. It might actually be one of these indicators. Um, and then, of course, overpowering delusions. Again, mental health plays a huge part in this. Uh, and often these people, or not often, but certainly an experience where they feel that they've Sam Hub, they, they have no control over their actions. They've been invaded or interfered with and they're being directed, if you like, by radio waves or something. Um, and they believe that they're under attack, that, that, that somehow something is, is attacking them and they have to defend themselves. 
So again, if you get language or communication that is a bit off the wall and a bit bizarre, please don't just ignore it and exclude it of the, you know, the ranting of a, of a mad person. Um, it may well be a clear indication that something is wrong. So that concludes um, this webinar, which I hope has been interesting to you. Um, and I'll be really happy to answer any questions that you have. Brilliant, Philip. Fantastic. Um, I'll get you to just bring your uh, webcam back up and we'll start taking through the questions of which there are many. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just um, you want to put your camera back up, mate. Oh, I don't do that. No. Okay. So, is that it? Um, you see me now? Not yet. I'm getting a bit of feedback on my. Not to worry. Just uh, if you just go to the little camera button, turn it green. There we go. Gotcha. Right. Um, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. There's a lot to absorb there. And I'm just looking at the questions as they're coming in. I try and get through as many as we can. I realise we're just over the hour now. Um, but I think while we've still got 180 people listening, it's worth um, it's worth going through the questions and so on. So um, first, first of all, do you think do you think that all public figures um, and high profile people are targeted in the same way? I mean, you've talked through a number of things there, but are they all targeted in roughly the same way? No. So we know that um, politicians, as an example, are, are, are targeted in a different way to uh, celebrities. We know, for instance, that, you know, politicians are least likely to have intimacy followers, should we say, for obvious reasons, perhaps. Um, but certainly if you're a celebrity uh, or you're in the entertainment world, you are probably going to have fans. You're probably going to have intimacy followers. So that's that's probably going to be more prevalent amongst those than it is others. Um, clearly, the way you're going to get attacked is probably different. We know that politicians publish their diaries. They've got certain responsibilities and therefore people generally will will um, attack in certain locations with British politicians particularly. Um, so, no, it's a very unique set of circumstances. Um, you know, chief executives can get attacked because of policies that their company uh, uh, had in, you know, years ago before they were even there. Um, so, you know, it, it, it can be very random. So Simon asks along the same sort of lines, uh, do, you, do you find that clients often fail to recognise their own personal responsibility, take proportionate steps to protect themselves and their family? Yes, is a simple answer. Um, yeah. I think... I think there's two things. One is, um, in general, yes, I don't think they necessarily realise what's out there. Um, secondly, I think a very common one for me is where the individual that, that if you take chief executives and, and business people quite often, and politicians to some degree, um, particularly men, often they will say, oh, I'm not worried about me, it's my family. Um, and they don't seem to realise that actually they're under threat as well. Um, so some things I think they, 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 they dismiss it. Certainly when we uh, have given advice and guidance to people, um, they've ignored it because they decide that actually um, their exposure, their profile comes first um, and therefore they're going to accept those risks. Um, but yeah, I, th I think a lot of people, you know, personal responsibility is a huge thing for me and a lot of people could do a lot better by, by realising that some of the things they do, some of the stuff they say, some of the responses i mean certainly you know if you're getting abused online the, the, the simple thing is don't respond because you're never going to win the argument um, yeah. but trying to tell that to people and get them to do it is quite difficult at times i know we've got listeners on the line that have actually been victims of that themselves um and know that all too well um do you, are you familiar with the jill dando case intimately i, I know you know the jill dando case but i mean was jill yeah. dando case a howler or a, or a um a hunter i mean was that a howler well, turn? That I mean, I know. on the uh, if we take it from a legal perspective then so currently it's an open investigation because the person that was convicted had his over his conviction overturned so um i think um i would suggest that that individual was a hunter um i don't think there's any uh, uh, evidence of any direct communication from anyone and i would assume that anyone that made any direct threats has been investigated um, I mean, if you, if you look at it from its most 
most logical perspective, if you are planning to genuinely attack someone, why would you warn them? Yeah, yeah. Um, so even, but you know, that's that's kind of conscious process. The interesting thing is that even people who have delusional thoughts and maybe not um, are thinking as logically or as sanely as we might, they don't warn people either. Um, so, so um, in terms of Jill Dando, you know, simple answers I don't know, but I would make it. I would make a guess that they were a hunter uh, as opposed to a howler. So do you have a, do you have like a, this is from Keelan, um, the, the assessment, the risk assessment, do you have like a set methodology you use with questions that would be, I guess, um, comparable to the dash? If, you know, going yeah. back, a, if, if I was, if I, in an abusive relationship and I, you know, escaped and then I was being stalked by my partner, I would complete a dash report. And if anybody's listening, that is in that position where they feel, you know, they're listening to this because they're a victim of stalking domestic violence. There is a thing called a domestic abuse a stalking harassment checklist that you can Google it online. But a dash report helps you identify the things that you think will be a real trigger <coughs> that you could absolutely pay attention to. What do you, how do you develop it for your thing for, for clients, for high profile clients, which is a slightly different thing? So we we have a number of uh, packages that we have developed that um, that cover that off. So we have we have a safe one one called the safer model, which is uh, an all encompassing model. We um, so we you know in in essence uh, a lot of it is done digitally for us, but a lot of it is around um, context because one of the real challenges of what we're talking about here is everything's in context. So when you when you one of the challenges with a lot of some of the research around online abuse, for instance, is that that's all based on people putting keywords in and getting results of how many you know how many people have got abused by this keyword or what have you. But the truth of the matter is that if I say to you on on a on a social media post I'm going to kill you, um, then you probably will dismiss that. If I say something like I know where your kids go to school, um, that will be far more worrying to you. Um, now the interesting bit is. You won't pick that up on a keyword search because those words will never get picked up. You get you get so much that you just wouldn't pick it up. So what we're actually looking at in terms of online stuff a lot of the time is context. So at the moment, most of it's done manually and we do it manually. We have a digital team that manually investigates the Internet and knows what they're looking for, knows where to look for in the dark web and everything else. And we've got packages and processes that we do for our clients. Um, but we are looking to automate that and we're in talks with a with an AI company about how we do that because because most of the AI it, it is quite prescriptive and we're looking at we're looking at being context driven. So you have to build in the context. So um, even if you were doing it on AI, we'd still manually look at it because you will miss so much if you don't know what you're looking for. And of course, what could be really personal to you, Rich, and what, what would mean something to you wouldn't mean something to me. So in terms of. Um, a subtle indicator online that someone's being abusive or an ex-partner is stalking you or something. Um, you know, again, it's context-driven. Yeah, and I guess this is the this is the issue with psychology, isn't it? Um, it's just infinite, and so it's very difficult yeah. to get down without going through the the processes. And, and so a number of the, the questions are around whether there's a template. But the truth is, the the fact no. that diffuse is coming to into being is is to answer the the problem that there is no uh, other than domestic violence um, stalking harassment piece. There is no specific template out there that that you could hang your hat on and say this will one size fits all because one size could never fit all. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a sash one as well. There's dash and there's sash. The sash is the stalking one. Um, I, I'm not a massive fan of either, if I'm honest, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, what we what we're saying about this is these are indicators. So that if if you have a, a stalking case and you know who the suspect is, then it's quite simple. You can look through these and see does he have all these various issues and what have you, and is he stalking? And if he is, and uh, he's committing an offence, so you know he's in in play. You know what we're looking at is you're a public figure, you're getting abused, but you don't know who it is, or you're a public figure and you're being targeted by a former employee who has a grievance. How do I know if he's posing me a threat? How do I know how to deal with this person? So the way we do that, and if I talk about a particular uh, case recently, we had a, I think I've made reference to it, we had a, a guy in New York who's been threatened by a guy in the UK who was sacked a couple of years ago. So there was a stream of, uh, of communication. Some of it was leaking bits and bits and pieces. Some of it was um, around the sort of things we've been talking about today. 
So what we did in that case was we did a full digital analysis of him to see was there anything online that leaked any of this information we've talked about here? Uh, anything on the dark web as well? Um, was there anything that we could find that was reputationally harmful for the company or the individual? Any indication he was traveling or moving because of course um, he was in the UK and the other guy was in New York. Um, but what we also do is we, you know, one of the, one of the people that uh, I work with and who is probably the most eminent psychologist around stalking in the world, she works with me. And so we were able to capture all of his communication and make a forensic analysis of his communication and actually diagnose him based on that, anal that, uh, that communication. And then we're able to say, these are his issues. This is what his, his, his mental issue is, if you like, his mental health issue. And this is how you treat this scenario. Because if you do X, Y, and Z, you're going to play into his hands. So we suggest you do this. Um, and these are the reasons why. So here, here's a piece of advice about how you deal with this individual. But here's also the reassurance he doesn't pose you a physical threat. Now, of course, the anomaly is this is about looking at, OK, he doesn't pose you a, a physical threat. But we know about the subject of target dispersal. So is he going to divert his attack towards the London office? So then, of course, we work with the London office to say, you know, this is what you need to be looking for. This is the sort of things you need to be watching for. Um, but we don't actually think he's going to do that based on his psychological profile. Um, so when we talk about, you know, we're talking very much about personalities and individuals now, but um, questions coming in around whether, you know, when, when a business is being targeted, maybe it's a political idealism or, or counter against the forces, for instance, that sort of thing. How does it, how does it vary when you're when you're looking at attacks against a person, violence against a person, but against yeah. an establishment? Well, it doesn't. It's exactly the same, really. I mean, I mean, it, it, what we have to understand is if you're talking about a fully trained, you know, let, let's kind of go far fantasy work, assassin, yeah. he won't do any of this. He or she won't do any of this. But... If you're looking at eco-terrorism, as an example, um, there will be some of this, not all of it, but some of it. Um, now, certainly when we were looking at the third runway a while ago, you know, they were they were really sure they operated in small cells where no one knew what they were doing, allegedly. And, and you know, they went in clean, had nothing on them, etc. But, you know, we've also looked at other areas where, again, there's leakage, there's stuff on, on, on forums and what have you. Um, there is change of behavior. There's hostile reconnaissance. There is, um, you know, random offences they've committed all of a sudden. So when you, when you, what you're doing is you're looking and saying, okay, we're going to narrow our focus. But if you also understand, we touched it on the pathway around the component parts of what threat and vulnerability and risk actually are. It shows you where you need to be focusing your efforts in terms of, okay, we're an organisation that have been targeted, so we need to make sure that we're. Um, you know, looking at what these grievances are by these people, can we can we resolve these grievances? If it's an ecological thing, do we need to have a conversation with them, engage with them, change our ecological processes? Um, but if we can't do that, then we need to look at our vulnerabilities and make sure that we, you know, we're, we're reviewing our security plans and we are giving security advice to our high profile people. Um, but equally, we need to limit the harm they're going to do in terms of what, you know, what offences they can commit against us. So it's going through that whole process in terms of looking at and, and I think actually, you know, you and I have talked about this in, in detail around really understanding the theory of what risk and threat actually is to know what to do about it. So, um, yeah, but, you know, I, I work with quite a few high profile companies at the moment and, and we're seeing this because of, you know, the, the, the threat of redundancies and un, high unemployment coming up and all the things we've talked about earlier around grievances. And so companies need to get themselves ready because I genuinely believe this is this is coming over the, the hill. Um, and, and Robert Ashman, who um, attacked Lord Jones uh, turn of the century and ended up killing his member of staff, exactly this scenario. Now, he thought he was being targeted by utility companies. So he targeted the utility companies backwards. He got mm. arrested for a random act of violence. Um, his MP was on his side and suddenly he thought, actually, he's against me now. And he'd say where to kill him. Um, so these people don't just pop up from nowhere. You know, when you when you when you dig back into it, you know, he will tell me, Do you know, what? there are so many times I thought, I should probably talk to someone, but I think I can help him. Um, so, you know, sometimes I think it's staring you in the face. So Lee, Lee asked a question, but it's quite specific uh, around the pathway to targeted intent. So when somebody turns from a, a howler into a hunter, do we do you typically see a drop off in social media output as they turn from one to the other? Is it an indication? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Certainly, if if they are. If they if they are so they generally turn from a from a, a howler to a hunter because they're being ignored because they're not getting what they want. 
So that will be a classic sort of domestic stalking case where they are being ignored or they, um, uh, and again, another, another thing that sometimes turn howlers into hunters is interventions. So an injunction gets put on them. Yeah. Um, and so all of a sudden that's a trigger for them to change from one to the other. So, you know, certainly if you are ever in a position where you're serving an injunction on someone or you're, you're, you're going to be taking any action, that's the time where you need to prepare yourself for, for an increase in activity or a change in activity. Um, but it, I, I wouldn't say that someone goes from being a howler to hunter will change, uh, will, will see a difference in social media other than um, they may not make many threats. If it's a domestic case, so it's an intimacy case, they will make threats. And mm. that's why when we see domestic, when we see cases where we have domestic threats on, online, we take them very seriously because they are the anomaly in, 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 the, in the research around that. Yeah, understood. Um, so bring it, uh, Bill Anderson had a, an interesting question around whether there's a, um, a correlation or connection with insider threat. Do you have any examples of where insiders become fixated in the problem? Yeah, I mean, and, and one of the things we've seen, certainly in the US a couple of years ago now, was um, this kind of insider activist. Um, so uh, I'm trying to think of a company off the top of my head now, but a major company in the US um, was targeted by a group of activists within the company. So they, I think it might have been um, something like WeWork or something. And so they found out that the company that supplied them with the furniture also supplied an immigration center with the same furniture and they were against this immigration center so they started targeting the company in, internally by saying we're unhappy with you uh, and your suppliers um, and basically without any unions or anything else they ended up bringing the whole company down on a strike um, so that's one example of how they're kind of inside a threat about grievances um, but certainly you know we know that almost every inside a threat is driven by a grievance unless they have gone in there with the intent to become a insider threat so um, I think increasingly so when we're working with businesses who are looking to make someone who's a problem redundant um, you know and we're looking to counter the insider threat um, there, there are processes we go through with a psychologist and we're working with them around how we can try and stop them becoming an insider threat um, but I think you know we need to look at what the grievance is what, what is the reason is this person being turned down for a promotion and have they just been abandoned uh, I mean, I know my own experiences in the Met when some people didn't get promoted, it was treated so badly. Um, it was they were just kind of discarded. And so you're not good enough. And that's the end of it. Well, if you're doing that in industry or you're doing that in business, um, you know, you may be really upsetting people and, and they then have a grievance and they then uh, decide this is how we're going to get our own back. So I think absolutely some of this and they'll almost certainly leak information. Um, so I think some of the some of the uh, methodology we've been talking about absolutely will impact on the insider threat for for corporations yeah yeah interesting and has to be considered um scott is uh, i happen to know is dialing in from canada and he works in the ngo sector and, and has a big responsibility uh, for running you know the security of his of the employees for the business he works for across lots of fragile states now let's say um their business is targeted what advice is best to be giving to the employees to make them aware of, you know, they bec could become the proxy target because the business is targeted, but they're away from the normal confines of safety and security because they're in a, a fragile state working on a, a, you know, some kind of mission. Yeah. Well, I, I guess it's kind of general security advice, really, in terms of, you know, be suspicious of somebody wants to suddenly friend you on LinkedIn or, or you know, or, or uh, Facebook or what have you. Uh, be mindful of, of, of your security, your personal security, you know, what, what information you're sharing, what literature you're leaving around in your desk. Um, you know, you know, if, if someone suddenly starts trying to, okay, befriend you is a big one, but, but I, you know, I genuinely think it's kind of personal and uh, normal security processes. I mean, um, but, I, but I also, you know, I think it's, we, you're looking for something out of the normal, basically. And I think the biggest thing for me is, having systems and processes in place where people can report back of concerns and and debriefing so actually people can say actually i saw something a bit weird today when I, this guy tried to follow me into the building um where and knowing where to report it if you make it difficult to report stuff people just can't be bothered so actually you know thinking about uh, i mean i i've got a friend of mine who does um penetration testing and he guarantees he can get in anywhere and I, i've employed him and he has got in some 
incredible places. And he, he also forget the easiest thing is to get a female walking up with two cups of coffee <clears throat> to a door, because a bloke will almost certainly hold the door open for it. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, if you suddenly see somebody who's not wearing a lanyard and they're trying to get into a building with two cups of coffee and you don't know them, ask them who they are. And I think yeah. we need to get into that, to that, remind people consistently around, around the simple security processes you've already got in place. Uh, and just if something stands out, report it and have a process where it gets escalated, investigated and fed back. Yeah, I know. And I know Scott and I know his, his expertise in travel risk management is chartered security professional for this. And I'm, I'd be surprised if you're not got all this covered off, Scott, already. But it's good to raise that issue. Um, thanks for that. And good to hear from you. Um, so a couple of questions have been based around the questions of um, mental health, maybe bipolar. Um, you know, mental health illnesses that can change specific behavior. You know, they maybe they, they they behave one way one day and another way the another day. I mean, how do we cope with assessing that aspect? Well, I think I think we have to make the um, we have to have the viewpoint to, because someone's got mental health doesn't mean they pose a threat or a risk. That's the first point. So mm -hmm. just because somebody has got mental health and their behavior is a bit erratic doesn't mean they pose a threat. Um, you know, equally, um, you don't have to have mental health to pose a threat. Um, I'm not a mental health specialist. I, I happen to employ one and I have one who who is. And that's who we obviously we will always refer to. But I wouldn't say someone's got bipolar or someone's got erratic behavior or they behave bizarrely is necessarily a threat. There's a lot more to it before someone becomes a person of concern. Yeah. OK, so. Um... Now, Debbie, although she's gone, but I, I will feed this back to her. She works in uh, government, in one of the government departments in our group membership, uh, but she works within the HR and screening aspect inside a threat. We're coming back to the inside a threat piece. Is there, a, is there um, a way of identifying triggers within the vetting process that, that could identify potential insiders, stroke, um, disgruntled people that, that are trying to infiltrate an organisation you know, is, is that something you dealt with when you were working within Parliament? Um, well, no, because we weren't involved in that process, but but we do it ourselves now. We, we provide a digital audit system. So we, we, we provide that as a service to clients. And, um, you know, if, we, if we're doing, we can do it as a standalone product, but we do it as a, as a kind of um, a, a bulk service as well. And, uh, you know, we do digital audits. We, we search the internet for, for where we know people communicate these sort of things. You're looking for the sort of triggers and, and things we've been talking about. Um, and nobody is, uh, is, you know, very few people these days in, in the workforce are invisible online. So if someone is invisible online, that kind of raises a few flags for me. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think you've got to do a proper digital audit. And, and I, I know from my experience of working in, public sector and policing and government that's not always done very well because they don't always have access to the to the sort of places where these people will communicate or operate um and you know i think um if someone's not telling you the truth around certain things and you're finding certain things that are out there that's always a a, a reason for concern and, and a conversation to be had but but you know we don't we as a private company don't have to uh we're not you know we're not consigned by Ripper and all sorts of stuff. So we, we uh, you know, our experts search all sorts of places and find all sorts of things about people. And sometimes we do it, we've done one recently for a sports agent who um, who is worried about what's out there about him um, because he's obviously going to transfer season and looking to buy people and he's worried about that kind of commercial espionage and what have you. So we've done, we've done audits for people to say, there's nothing out there about you as well. Okay. Um... I'm just going to finish off now because we're coming towards the, the sort of half hour and the last five minutes. I just want to, um, to to round up with a couple of of quite pertinent fast fire. Uh, one being, if you tell the police, uh, is that going to accelerate the attack? And I, you know, I wonder how you balance that against, you know, not reporting to the police because you think that it will accelerate the attack. I mean, where's the balance? I can't think of many circumstances why, where if you tell the police, it's going to accelerate an attack. Um, and first and foremost, if you tell the police, it's their responsibility to deal with the attack. Um, yeah. But, you know, certainly in the circumstances I've worked in, um, there are times when threats have been accelerated for all sorts of reasons, globally political reasons. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think certainly I'm always very wary when people start talking about injunctions and 
um, harassment notices and stalking warnings and that sort of stuff. That's great if you've got someone that goes alongside it so to monitor that individual and see how they behave. But if you just serve something and expect them to go quiet, it almost does almost never happens. That's normally a trigger. And so sometimes, in, so I've dealt with a case in the last few months where a person's being stalked. The police weren't taking it particularly seriously. Um, they asked me to, to get involved, which we did, um, and we were advising them how to deal with it. And when they talked, to, the police talked about, oh, we're going to go and serve an injunction. We said, OK, well, if you're going to do that, um, we want to know when you're going to do it because we can mon monitor the person because he will react to this. Um, and, and certainly when I was in the, when I was running the team in Parliament, if ever I was running for the national side and we would, we would, you know, the police in another part of the country were doing it, we would do exactly that. When you're going to do something, monitor the activity around it because it will always have a trigger effect. But that's the police's responsibility. Um, yeah. And so if you as a as a security manager or, or, or like, you know, if you, if you have a suspicion and you inform the police, it's their responsibility to deal with it. Um, and it isn't yours anymore. I guess not all police forces are equal, and we're assuming True. that you. True. So, so again, um, if you're in foreign parts of the country and foreign parts of the world, rather, um, you need to think about that and factor that in about how your response is. Um, but um, you know, any negative response will trigger something, whoever is by. Yeah, yeah, great. So, last last question here is, uh, and there's a good summary. What books would you recommend um, are there out there that, you know, what further reading would you recommend on this topic that, um, what do you have on your shelf? I see you looking. Well, What's I'm on... looking at my shelf now and it's packed full of books. Um, <laughs> and, some of them are, and some of them are better than others. Uh, I'm trying to um, see if I can see the one that's, uh, that's, um, written about the hunters and the hawk i will find them out and i will provide a list for you how about that okay because i mean the guys that wrote um hunters and howlers they've, they've written a book about it robert fine has not written a book he has written a thing called uh the exceptional case report which you can find a pdf version online that yeah. is the initial research from the 50 secret service 50 years of secret service attacks that's well worth a read because that's the yeah. basis of most of this um the hunters and howlers went on from there uh, and I, I, I will probably find it the minute I log off, but it's on my on my bookshelf amongst many other books. I'm sure if they Google it, they'll they'll find it. But that's the one that yeah. wouldn't be too hard to find. Um, yeah. Look, Philip, uh, fascinating. And the fact is, you know, we still had well almost 200 people still dialed in um, half an hour after we were due to finish. So. I think that's uh, tantamount to a successful webinar. And on behalf of everybody that's listening at home, thank you very much for your time. Um, and if we were in an auditorium, you'd have a, a rapturous round of applause right now. But, well, thank you very much. And um, you know, anyone wants to contact me, please do with any questions. I'm more than happy to help. That's brilliant. Um, so for those of you still on online now, uh, just a quick update on what's coming up in the next week. We always like to have a look forward. Tomorrow evening at five o'clock uh, UK time, the Inclusivity Special Interest Group will be having uh, its inaugural webinar around developing diversity and inclusivity in security uh, with some brilliant speakers. So that's another free event to dial into. Those that are looking at chartered security professional, there are application workshops still being planned. Um, there are two up on the website you can book onto now, one for the 6th of August, one for the 20th of August. For those in the UK around the London area on the 11th of August, we have the members lunch, though there are very, very few places remaining. We're going to risk uh, meeting uh, in person, uh, but for much reduced numbers and following the, the distancing guidelines that are in place at the venue. Um, so keep an eye on the website for up and coming bits and pieces. Um, we hope you've really enjoyed this, this webinar session and uh, we look forward to welcoming you back again. As always, thank you to my team in the background, Jade and Becky, that were putting the polls up and uh, making sure everything runs smoothly. Um, your feedback would be greatly appreciated when you get the feedback forms. It's how we decide how we take the webinars forward. So until next time, everybody, please stay safe. Philip, thanks again. See you soon.